afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Cultural Development Foundation's Emancipation Panel Discussion. Our theme for this year is Emancipation Through Your Eyes, Tourism, Politics, and Economic Freedom. And um, we first have to say this event was made possible with the assistance of Flo, Baywalk Shopping Mall, and of course, NTN. With me, I have a wonderful panel of, of um, sorry, panelists, and I'm going to introduce them starting with Mr. Ember Charles. Mr. Ember Charles has served as the executive director of the Folk Research Center for the last decade, providing leadership in cultural administration research and documentation, and was part of a regional NGO movement for more than 15 years. He was the managing director of the Eastern Caribbean Telecommunications Authority from 2008 to 2017, which has responsibility for the regulation of the telecommunications environment in the five member states of the Commonwealth of Dominica, Grenada, St. Kitts and Nevis, St. Lucia, and St. Kitts, sorry, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Before this, Mr. Charles served as the Director of Information Services in the government of St. Lucia and was the Communication Advisor and Public Awareness Consultant with the OECS. He's a graduate of the University of the West Indies with a degree in Communication and Social Sciences and Regulation and Policy with relation to communication, telecommunication. He also possesses a master's in philosophy in developmental studies from the University of Sussex. He has written on many aspects of Caribbean life, including cultural development, media, electronic communications, as well as the Creole language. Welcome, sir, and we are very happy to have you here with us. Our next panelist is, sorry, We have so many wonderful persons here. I'm just looking for, yes, Mr. Preville. Very happy to have you here soon. Mr. Preville is the Permanent Secretary with the Department of Commerce, Business Development, Industry, Enterprise Development, and Consumer Affairs. Prior to his reappointment to that ministry, he served as the PS in the Department of Labor a position he assumed in March 2015 until July 2016. He has also previously served as the PS of the Ministry of Commerce, Business Development, Investment, and Consumer Affairs between June 2007, October 2009, and June 2012 to March 2015. He has also been the Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Tourism and Civil Aviation from November 2009 to June 2015. He's had a long career as a public servant. Uh, he began in 1984 as um, an information officer with the government information services. And in 1990, he was appointed chief information officer and uh, at the time attained a postgraduate diploma in mass communication from the Caribbean Institute of Mass Communications at Mona Campus in UWE. He also has a degree in economics and management from the University of the West Indies. He completed his master's in economics in 1995 and served as an economist in the Ministry of Planning until December 1996. He's also served with the St. Lucia Air and Seaport Authorities as the Director of Economics and Research. He returned to the public service in 2001 and was assigned in 2002 to the Ministry of Commerce as the Director of Commerce and Industry until 2005. And then he was appointed Deputy Permanent Secretary and then Permanent Secretary. Within his time as Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of uh, Tourism and Civil Aviation, he served as a board member of the St. Lucia Tourist Board, LIAT, and the uh, chairman of the Finance Committee of the Civil, Civil Aviation based in Antigua. 
He's also a tutor and has tutored many different courses with the University of the West Indies Open Campus from micro and macroeconomics to quantitative methods and managerial economics. We are very happy to have you here. Welcome, sir. And of course, we have with us Ms. Tyler Lagon. She is an independent political economic analyst and commentator, and she's an alumni from the American University of Paris. She attained graduate honors and a bachelor's degree in international economics and international and comparative politics. Her two highly reviewed political theses have been published and they center on Caribbean pol pol political and economic um, influences. And um, her participation, she has participated in quite a number of uh, college discussions and political forums focusing on economics. Ms. Lago has been rec was recognized in 2015 as the most honorable speaker in the Harvard International MUN Conference for the United Nations Council on Economics and Social Development. She continues to participate in international youth panel discussions and UN assemblies and remains an active commentator and an an analyst through economic think tanks such as the um, ECON1 and uh, EFRG, right? Yes. And she's done all of this and she's only 24 years old. Yeah. Okay. She, start her, she started her career eight years ago with um, Halo Incorporated, a fashion company engaging in trade and medium scale manufacturing. And as the lead administrative assistant, she has ensured that the business relationships, procurement, sales, and investments in mass manufacturing machinery was very successful from 2009 to 2013. And she has recently returned to this post. She has also been involved in carnival tourism and cultural development through her executive membership to the Tabu Carnival Band and the associate membership with the St. Lucia Carnival Bands Association. We welcome you. Thank you for being here. And finally, we have with us Mr. Cuthbert Didier, an economist by profession and with a BA and certification from many universities. Mr. DJ was employed by the Rodney Bay Marina for 25 years, 12 of those as the general manager. He was instrumental in sourcing investors and coordinating the sale of the marina to Island Capital Group of the United States. After the sale of the marina, he, re re he remained until 2009, when it was sold in 2006. He has completed several tourism and yachting related consultancies for the Caribbean Hotel and Tourism Association, the United Nations, as well as regional agencies. Among those were groundbreaking yachting economic impact studies in 2001 and 2002 for eight Caribbean islands. In addition, he has completed the first hotel tax impact re re um, study in 16 Cari Forum Islands in 2005 and has published numerous management articles in Yachting World and Marina World. In 2015, Mr. Didier completed a new yachting survey for the EU and presented his findings at the EU Biz Forum, for Bi Forum in Russell's in 2016. He has served as the director of the St. Lucia Tourist Board and currently serves on the board of the Soufre Marine Management As Association, Tapio Hospital, the St. Lucia Tourism Board, Radio St. Lucia, and the Foundation for Development of Caribbean Children. Okay. As a former maritime consultant with the Ministry of Tourism, Heritage, and Creative Industries, Mr. Didier was charged with implementing the policy and and strategy for the further development of yachting and water-based tourism. 
And that consultancy position he had from 2009 to 2017. Welcome and thank you for being here with us. So we have quite a distinguished um, group of panelists here. And we are very happy and excited to hear what it is that they are going to impart on us with regards to our theme. What we are going to do right now, um, in relation to the theme that I mentioned earlier, I'm going to read a short blurb on what inspired the theme, and then I'm going to ask each panelist to give their thoughts on it. Again, the theme is emancipation through your eyes, tourism, politics, and economic freedom. Our very existence hinges on elements of our work ethic, identity, language, economy, the way we live, our communities, looking at what has made us what we are today. Thus building and transforming our nation into a place where we can celebrate our past while working towards building a future. As a nation, we are on the brink of an economic revolution that brings to the fray the balancing act of our independence and dependence on colonial structures or new systems that resemble the old ideologies of a distant past. Quite a lot there to mull over. And uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Charles to be the first one to share his musings, you know, on this topic. Thank you very much. I'm a very cautious opening batsman, so I won't hit a four off the bat. But just to say, I find the, the topic in particular poses some stark contra contradictions. Uh, when you speak about economic freedom and you tag tourism to it, one begs, it begs the question, to what extent can tourism as our major industry provide a platform for economic freedom for our people? Tourism is a sector which is linked to the global economy. We know of the vulnerabilities of the tourism sector. We know of the potential as well. But at the same time, if it is the sector that has to determine the priorities for our people, then clearly we have to think the extent to which it is integrated into other sectors in our economy and our society. The other major question we have to ask ourselves is how does an economic sector determine or influence our political structures, our political decisions, and our political leaders for that matter? So I think these are the big questions that come before us, and um, it's even more poignant now within the context of emancipation. Um, does that present a platform for thinking that we are an emancipated people? That's my opening comment. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Charles. Yes, go ahead, sir, Mr. Preville. I would have given the lady the opportunity. But um, yeah, like, like him, but my prelim preliminary comments are that the topic itself is very contradictory, but very, um, very dynamic. Um, we think of emancipation, and we think of colonization in the, we think of emancipation, and we think of independence. Um, my initial comments are that a country, a state like ours, small and open, because everything in life is relative. And for a small country like St. Lucia, what does independence mean? Um, and, and what value do you really have as an independent country? So for me, I approach that topic by saying to myself that independence is the right that a nation state has to decide for itself. Um, it is also the right to decide to be dependent. So for me, the notion of words like independence are synonymous with words like emancipation. And I look at that in the context of a small economy that by virtue of its openness will always be interdependent. So the issue now is how does a country that will always be interdependent exercise 
independence? And how do you carve out an independence um, 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 posture in a very today interdependent world? So these are my preliminary thoughts as we begin to talk. Now I should mention as we go forward that the first half of this um, session, we will of course have, hear from our different panelists, we'll have a discussion, and then of, we will then open the floor to you, our audience. I'll be very happy to have you here with us today. Now, before we go to Ms. Lago, let me again say um, a thank you to Baywalk Shopping Mall, to the Cultural Development Foundation, Flo, as well as um, NTN for allowing this, and I think it's a very important discussion. As you can see so far, some very interesting ideas and um, thoughts are coming through. Now, I know that I'm sure you have some interesting thoughts to add to this. So, let's go ahead. I think obviously, um, be it that we're approaching Emancipation Day and the likes, it's very important that we do focus on the question of where we are today vis-a-vis um, -vis where we were a couple of years ago when we were on the brink of emancipation, fighting the colonial struggle, um, etc. So now that we're looking at tourism, which is, which is important in, this, in the dead center of our economy, an economy linked to politics, it does beg the question. And we know that a lot of persons are of the opinion that our tourism industry is like enslavement. Let's, let's get that on the table, that most persons do assume that. We have the likes of our own Derek Walcott mentioning in his poetry, um, the illusion of, of our own economy being the same cycle of, of enslavement and being dependent on, on, the, foreign, on the foreign European power. So um, this, of course, probes my thinking into how far into tourism are we exactly going? Is our country just focused on hotel tourism or are we looking into other sectors which is also very important? And I think that that should be a leading question moving forward in how we approach the topic of emancipation, tourism, politics and economics. Thank you very much, Mr. Didier. Oh, very interesting set of words crafted together. Tourism, politics, economic freedom. Very timely, based on the narrative, the prevailing narrative for the last six months, some of the challenges with the potential investment opportunities and hard decisions. When I think of tourism, I think of 1492. Maybe that was our first tourism. Was it invasion or investment? Politics, when I think of politics, I think of two Latin words, poly and ticks, many bloodsuckers. And economic freedom might be a bit of an illusion in this global dispensation because we do have the new colonialists that are knocking on our doors. So very timely, these three words, but as a nation, to really have an open discussion, the narrative must change. And the narrative must first start with the politicians because that is where the art of governance comes from. So three powerful words, well crafted together, and I must say timely for emancipation. Thank you very much. Quite a bit here to give you, you know, some food for thought to start to think. And to help you, we're going to take a short break right now to think of, you know, some of the things that have come up. We talked about integration, the contradictory nature of our topic. We talked about what does independence really mean? Was it in invasion? Invest, was it invest, what did you say? Investment or invasion. Investment or invasion. The whole idea of it being an illusion. So, where are we? What is it? Some interesting ideas coming up. So, as I said, we'll be back after a very short break to continue the discussion. The St. Lucia National Trust. We champion the conservation of sensitive and priceless national assets. Your membership is valuable to us in supporting and influencing the policymakers and developers to conserve our environment. Rescue St. Lucia. Come partner with the St. Lucia National Trust today. And we are back with our emancipation panel discussion. 
And so far, we've had some very thought-provoking ideas thrown out at us from our panelists. And to start the discussion off, we're going to look at our economist next to me here, Mr. Kerfer Didier, to give you know, a few thoughts based on what his fellow panelists have said. Well, I'm, I'm really intrigued by, and it's refreshing to hear all the different angles. But I want to focus on the word emancipation because it screams of freedom and the act of being free. And I want us to really look at ourselves in the mirror. As a nation, are we truly free? And when I say free, are we truly free in the term of a sovereign nation? Are we free to make decisions in this global imperative? I, I want to give a snapshot. Our economy is in challenging times. The Ameri in America, herb ganja is on its way to being legal and it's being sold and dispensed for medical purposes. Yet still, the great USA comes down in helicopters and tells us what to do with the very thing that's free in their country. So are we really free to make decisions as a sovereign nation? Tourism, having been in that sector for a long time, it's, I think all of us in the Caribbean suffer from a schizophrenia in tourism. We seem to think that the foreigner is going to come and save us with foreign direct investment. We don't seem to seize the opportunity to invest in ourselves. It is, it's, it's an open tap to give concessions to these masses that are coming with a new dispensation. I don't say massa. I use the word massa because I think tourism may be the new plantations on the beach, the way I see it, based on the prevailing narrative. And it may be a time for us as Negmawas to really seize the opportunity as, and really cherish that freedom of our history, the whole colonialism, the whole the vibrance of reggae and Rastafarianism, and look at us as small states with unique opportunities to remain ourselves, but unique. I am not so sure the brick and mortar building huge monstrosities, monstrosities on the beach is really an industry. And it might be actually a dilemma as we move forward. So it's timely because of the narrative, but we're having this discussion not really being free. Yes, sir, I see Mr. Um, Preville reaching for his mic. Yes, sir, let's hear your comments. Yes. Um, let me take off where, where Kovbert left. Um, I have a slight of a different approach to him in terms of how you perceive tourism. I think there are some realities we have to face, and these are the things that, that uh, we need to confront with as a small country. First of all, I think as a nation, we need to decide what we are, who we are, and I don't think we've had many, many opportunities for us to, def to actually agree what we are as a people. And I believe the most important thing for any country is deciding what your values are what it is you stand for, what it is you will not stand for. It doesn't mean you may get away with what you want, but you at least define for yourself what you believe. I don't know we have done that, and I don't know we teach that in our schools to, to, to the extent that we have St. Lucians who know what it means to be St. Lucian. Because if you don't know where you are and who you are, then you get lost in the maze of things around you and other people around you. And you might be intimidated by tourism. Um, but the, the intimidation perhaps comes about, comes about because you don't know. So we need to have our value system clear. We need to have a sense of our norms and our history. And we need to also have some idea as to where we want to go. And then we need to decide, we need to look at ourselves and look at our constraints and then decide what vehicle will help us get to where we are, retaining what and who we are. Now, the truth is our country has been always from slavery. We were founded on the basis of international trade. Slavery was a form, was international trade. First, then we followed that up with sugar, and in the case of St. Lucia, bananas, and maybe cocoa to a lesser extent. 
again engaged in international trade. We followed that up with, and in parallel, we developed tourism. Because tourism didn't come on all of a sudden. If you look at the GDP figures of our country, and I went, I took some time to go through it, you will realize that tourism has always been somewhere between it and now a lot higher in terms of percentage of GDP. Now, I'll just take two minutes because I need to say these things. Um, from 1995 to 2015, that's 20 years. If you look in 1995, agriculture constituted about 10.58% of GDP. In 2000, it was 6.4. In 2005, it fell to 3.66. 2010, 3.33. And in 2015, 1.9% of GDP. Agriculture has been on the decline. Tourism, 10.62% in, in 1995, 11.88% 2000, 13.63% 2005, and it has remained about that in this period. What has happened to our country in terms of our economic growth? In, in 1995, our country was growing at 7.4% a year. Remember, agriculture was 10.58. Tourism was 10.62. When we get to 2000, we had negative growth. Agriculture, 6.4. Tourism, 11.88. I fast forward. So we're now in 2011. Agriculture is 1.9%. Tourism, 10.9. GDP growth, 2%. What is unemployment like? In 1995, our level of unemployment was 15.9%. In 2000, 16.5%. In 2005, 18.7%. In 2010, 20.6%. In 2015, 24.1%. Now, so we have a country, we have an economic activity. The economic activity is primarily an international trade activity. Is it addressing our growth rate? The data says no. Is it addressing unemployment? The data says no. So the question now becomes, is this the vehicle? Now, I would say, when I look around me, I cannot put my finger on another vehicle. But I will also say, perhaps, the reason why that vehicle is not doing what we want it to do lies with us not the industry external to us, but us. Are we prepared? Do we want to put in systems and structures to make it work for us? The industry is vertically integrated. It is becoming increasingly vertically integrated. So the, the person who owns the accommodation now wants to own the tours, now wants to own the taxi, now, if that is the model that we will base our country's future on, I think we will have a problem. So for me, there is need for us to decide if we want to make that industry work, and I say now our options are limited, there must be horizontal integration. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Prewill. I saw Ms. Lago shaking her head while this was going on, so. I think you have some comments you might want to add to that? Absolutely. You agree, disagree? Yes. Um, Mr. Prevel has some very strong points that I do agree with. And just to take off from, from that and look at it in a more global perspective, um, as he did say, um, our, our agricultural industry was on a decline while we tend to put more efforts into, into tourism. Tourism now, as he said, is not too sure if it's the right vehicle. But I do want to look at the approach as well as Inusha's placement in the in the global in, in competitiveness, in tourism competitiveness, and where we stand and where we ought to be. Um, first of all, for the Caribbean on a wider scale, um, 
from the UNWTO organization, they highlight that from 1990 to 2015, um, increases in tourism for the Caribbean, they have been slow and steady. So we go from 11% international arrivals to 23% in the, in the span of, say, 20 years, almost. And that's just 12% growth in, in income from tourism. So we need to look at how much that is bringing to us and why that is the case. And that, for me, would have to be that we're too focused on hotel tourism. There are many aspects of tourism that we need to look into, but there's just been a focus on the sun and sea sort of destination, which is on the decline. And rightfully so, it is on a decline because times are changing, and we need dynamic structures, structures that are able to flex with the coming age. We have, we have the growth of the millennials. Millennials tend to be independent persons, and when you study their behavioral habits and travel patterns, they tend to not use hotels. They use the Airbnb. They don't want to go according to um, um, various tour, um, given tour guides, etc. They want to do it on their own. They hire what you call Uber, which is you know your taxi services to here and back. So if this is the new age of of persons coming into being and being economically active, then the platform that we're trying to still invest in, we're still investing in hotels, we're still investing in, um, in the cruise tourism, that is not technically helping us. And, it would, and to add to that point, the UN, have, the UNWTO, they have set an agenda and they're focusing for 2030 to incorporate more cultural tourism, cultural and entertainment tourism, which is something that we need to look into. Trinidad has been flourishing for years with their carnival, um, their carnival tourism, which brings in thousands in a short space of time. You have other islands benefiting from sports tourism, as well as St. Lucia did have jazz, which is being revamped. But we need to look at how it's being revamped at this critical point to ensure that in the future we do not fall back because tourism is not necessarily the wrong vehicle, but we're probably in the wrong gear. We need to change it up a bit and look at different focuses because the one we have now is definitely on a decline with the new age of um, tourists that is coming about. Thank you very much for those comments. Now I see Mr. Charles, he looks ready to, yeah, to say his, but we're going to ask him to wait just one minute because we are going to go to a quick, quick break. And uh, when we come back, we will start off with you. I'm so fed up with my 13-year-old child. She's driving me crazy. I just don't know what to do. All that child need is some good licks to wake up. Alice, ignore the counseling pansies given. Government employees have free access to professional counseling services under the Employee Assistance Program known as EAP. EAP? EAP? What's that? Uh, not me that telling people my business. Listen to me, Alice. I was struggling with my child. I made an appointment to see an EAP counselor, and I was very satisfied with the service that I received. And you know what? Up to a day like today, my information remains confidential. Cox, how come nobody in the office knew anything about your counseling? Ah, that's because EAP counselors, they work on the strict clauses of confidentiality. I know you know what confidential means. Eh, uh -uh. EAP providing professional counseling services? How much is it? Girl, the counseling is free. Free for you, free for your child. And you know what? Your information remains confidential. Call the EAP unit at the Ministry of the Public Service. Telephone number 468-2269 for more information. EAP works, let it work for you. And we are back and uh, Mr. Charles is raring to go with his comments. Mr. Charles, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I think these were excellent presentations by the three other panelists. But irrespective of the economic activity you decide to embark on, whether it's tourism or agriculture, the key question is to what extent it integrates everybody. Because you can have a situation, and we're, we're going to beginning to see it now, where our major economies are being controlled, um, economic activities controlled by monopolies. 
What choices do people have? And choices determine the extent to which you are free to move from one point to another or to make any kind of economic activity. So tourism as a main economic activity, I think Cuthbert and, and Titus made the point, the extent to which it is vertically integrated, which is, I think, a very dangerous trend for us to be taking. However, when you, when you Titus presented some statistics about what's happening in the economy, the, as far as economic freedom is concerned, St. Lucia is actually ranked very high in the region as a country that enjoys economic freedom. But this is based purely on statistics. Because you have a tight tourism sector now, which brings in revenue. Most of it goes out. But at the same time, you have high levels of unemployment. You have tremendous social activities and social uh, disturbances taking place because people are unemployed, because people can't feel satisfied. You have cases where um, the education is being driven by the major economic activity. So everybody's saying now you should teach everybody about tourism. What's about your life skills? What about your sense of identity? What's about ensuring that St. Lucians always feel proud when they go overseas to be called St. Lucians and to call themselves St. Lucians? But if you are in a situation where the economic activity keeps strangling your, 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 your country and the benefits going just to one set of people, then clearly you can't talk about emancipation being emancipated. You can't talk about economic freedom in a real sense. Statistically, it can work because you can have the figures to show that um, the country has earned so much revenue over a period of time. But does it filter? Does it cause other homegrown activities to take place and owned by ordinary St. Lucians. Tours now are being owned and operated by the companies who own the infrastructure, who own the transportation, who own other sectors of the, of the tourism sector. And the way it is structured is very difficult for a small entrepreneur to get in, in, involved in that kind of activity because you set all sorts of param parameters and rules. So it is, the, it is incumbent upon the state and the government now to ensure in the rules it sets that you do not exclude people, but it's highly inclusive. Thank you. I see Mr. Didier, yes. Bang on, bang on. <laughs> and I'll tell you why. When I think of emancipation, I obviously have to reference slavery. Slavery was an interruption to a great history. An interruption. I am not defined by slavery. It was an interruption. Therefore, to go to Embert's point, I want to focus on the politics because that's where it feeds in our governance. The people we elect to form governments and to shape our destiny and our vision must have a clear sense of the psyche of St. Lucia, and we must be first. So I am a bit perturbed and disturbed that a cabinet of ministers are the ones authorized to give concessions. I would prefer there was a checklist, qualification, and a way of measuring it. And that's the danger to me personally as an economist for this wave of tourism, because really and truly, as Ember said, and to a certain extent, Titus, whichever industry you focus on, the priority and the vision and the passion and the leadership must come from our political leaders. Whether it's tourism, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's agriculture, whether it's creative arts. I'll give an example. Reggae music, there isn't a ministry of reggae music in Jamaica. It's worldwide, Bob Marley. I dare anybody to quantify the economic value to GDP that reggae music brings in. It can't be captured, but it's worldwide. So it's not necessarily shaping a structure and an industry, but for us as a people, shaping a psyche that is unique to St. Lucia, that we can then export and that people come to consume. That's the type of tourism. I'm tired of the bricks and mortar on the beach. I am tired of these vertical integration, that one brand. Look at what's happening in the Caribbean. Look at what's happening in Antigua. Look at what's happening in Trinidad. 
where one brand controls the government. So we need to start as a people, focus, make sure that the leaders we put in there understands our psyche and puts us as a nation and as a people first. Thank you. A lot has been coming out um, from your comments about identity and the whole idea of we taking ownership. And you've brought up a point here that we should start off with our leaders. The politicians should be the ones to, to lead this. Any, the rest, any, kind, any thoughts on that, Ms. Ms. Lagon? The, the thoughts on identity um, and the reason that I think that it is so difficult to be captured in St. Lucia is that we're so used to, as um, one of my fellow panelists said earlier, we've, we have a history of international trade and going after the commu commercial. And what we have come, to, we've come to a point where in, in light of um, citizenship investment programs, we've come to the, void, to the point where we've also commercialized our sovereignty. And that is a political problem that we have to deal with where persons are given the option to buy citizenship into a country. So at that point, we start to decrease our value to attract foreign investment we're, we're selling ourselves short at that point. So what happens then is that persons are, the law no longer upholds for the foreigner who's coming with the money, the money that we so need. There's, the, the taxes do not apply to them either. And all of that falls the, on to the burden of the people. So we need to put, uh, we need to stand up to our governments and have them not sell us short. We are actually becoming whitewashed. We are losing our identity. We are losing our culture to become an, uh, quote unquote, a, a standard commodity on a shelf. And that's where the issue comes in. So if we start to advocate where St. Lucians are more forefront with, with being in charge of the, of the different industries, etc., or the different businesses, then we would definitely have a, a foot in in reclaiming our identity. Um, a lot of the time we go to say that, for instance, the hotel industries are owning the touring services, etc., but that is in the hotel brand. They, are, they do sell themselves from being all-inclusive. They sell one thing, money doesn't change hands, it just stays within themselves. So we need to fight that, and as I said, move away from the sun and sea tourism, which is hotels along the beachfront, and start to move into other um, forms of tourism, like Cuthbert did say, um, whether it be entertainment, whether it be culture, more importantly culture, which, revi which um, reawakens our identity. If we do so, then we will definitely be on the route to making, to making amends and fixing our economy. Okay, thank you. Mr. Charles? Yeah, I think one of the, the factors we have to realize is the nature of the relationship between the politics and the economic sector of our countries. Our leaders are largely influenced, sometimes dictated by, sometimes instructed by the major economic sectors. So if we were a very strong agricultural economy, that lobby would be determining who became our political leaders. When it became the manufacturing sector, now it is tourism, and you could, you could see the relationship. I think our big, biggest disappointment in recent times has been the, the underdevelopment of our civil society, of our NGO sectors. There was a time we were, very, we were flourishing with NGOs, and some, it was probably some imploding or self-destruction. But if we fail to pay attention to civil society, we'll be caught in this morass for a very long time. And when you see there's change, it comes out of civil society. The climate change movements, the movement for human rights, the movement for innovation, all the disruption comes from civil society. And if we don't disrupt, our society will remain static and we'll be talking about the same problem perhaps in the next 20 years. Go ahead, sir. Yeah, everybody's now speaking how I want to speak. Because, you see, I started off by saying, if you don't know who you are, if you don't have a value system, you just become a wishy-washy. And um, the truth of the matter is that when I leave St. Lucia and I go to Rome, I am not looking for anything from Russia. I'm not looking for anything from St. Lucia. I'm looking for something from Rome. So, 
So there must be something that is authentically Rome. That I will. That's why I go there. So if St. Lucia and St. Lucians who live in St. Lucia are not sure that they have something of value that the world needs or wants, then you can, then you are nothing. The, actually, the tourists will not want to come to see your country or your people. They will go to a brick and mortar structure. So, so what really makes, in my view, if the industry called tourism, and if this country is going to be based on tourism, what is its strength? Is actually making St. Lucia and St. Lucians more authentic. Not less authentic, more authentic. If, if our values can stand out more, if our way of life can stand out more, if our creativity can stand out more, people will want to come to see you. That's why they come here to see the Pitons, because they can't find it nowhere else. It is authentic St. Lucian. So my view, and Embad is making the point, if we don't understand that what, if it's tourism, that will drive tourism has to do about us, we will have missed the game. And secondly, this country has no forum where people talk. There is no forum where people sit and discuss anything. The guild or graduates, I don't know. The other forms of the, the community, the sports and cultural clubs, all the things that are supposed to nurture a sense of who you are are dysfunctional. So we have a real existential problem as a country. And when you add to that the issue of citizenship by investment, you have a real issue. So I think this country is at a point, and I think in your preamble you say we are at an economic crossroads. I think it's more than economic. We are at a point where as a nation state, we need to find who we are. And we need to create fora to enforce who we are. If we don't do that, we'll be having a discussion about us, St. Lucia, that will be something you won't be able to put your hand on very, very soon. But while we need the discussion, it has to also go the other route. Those that seek to govern us must seek consultation with us. And that's Governor, very important. Governor, but, listen, but, I, want to say, I want to say this on that. I believe. I believe that a country gets the government it deserves. I believe if a people don't know who they are and what they stand for, they will do whatever it is you see. So the change in the political leadership will only come about because the politicians don't come out of outside of us. No, just they come from within us. What? So it's there. We have to get the values there to get the kind of leaders we want. Point taken. But whoever we vote must understand that before they make decisions behind that door called cabinet, they must consult. There must be an intense level of consultation. And I'm agreeing with you. We, we get the government we deserve, but the election doesn't stop by winning. And our destiny is not shaped within five years. That is a short vision. You must consult us, because when you start to do things that will have an impact for the next 50, 40 years, it's serious. This is not a short run, li run life. And going back, I don't think the choice is between necessarily agriculture, tourism, manufacturing. I think the choice is between, within ourselves as a people to have articulate a vision. You know, it's funny. We celebrate no Nobel laureate. You know, Sir Arthur Lewis's thesis has never been discussed apart from a, a lecture to celebrate just around his birthday. Do we recognize, we keep comparing ourselves to Taiwan. Well, you know what? Taiwan not only studied they executed his thesis. We keep comparing ourselves to all, like Singapore. They didn't just study and discuss, they executed. And here's a guy, we build monuments, we put him on our money, but ask any child in a school about Sir Arthur Lewis and his thesis, investment by invitation, and areas where we can craft strong economies. It's not even discussed. Ask all the leaders who we've elected short of Vaughan Lewis, What's Arthur Lewis' thesis is about? They can't answer you. And you know, that's what I'm talking about, concert, because any person who wins a seat and goes into government does not know everything. 
he, is no, he or she is not an expert all of a sudden at everything. So he can't fashion my, my destiny, and I have a problem with that. So when we talk in emancipation, apart from economic freedom, I want the freedom as a citizen to tell him he's wrong. Mr. Charles, you want to add yes, to that? Just to support Cuthbert, because it's really about freedom of thought, freedom to think for ourselves. Very often, I'll give a very simple example. Any of you go to an establishment, and somebody takes your ID and goes to the back to photocopy it. He never asks you any questions. I say, but you can't photocopy my ID. You must get my consent to copy my ID. Then they tell you it's, that's the policy. There's no policy saying that you can copy my ID. I must give you permission to copy my ID. But the, the point I'm making you with that illustration is that we, we, we are so terrified of thinking for ourselves because of what we lose. We think that we are top of the line, so if they were asked to go back and um, talk to a manager, then we'll miss our turn at the line. We'll miss some crumbs on the, under the table. So we do not, we do not um, use that privilege to think for ourselves and exercise that freedom of thought. And too often, this sort of multiplies, and it becomes our being after a while. That, you know, okay, I'll, I won't bother with this. Um, somebody spells your name wrong. You try to explain to them, my name is spelled with an E, not an I, or whatever. Then you, you get into some problems down the road because they didn't listen to you. And again, you were so, not so fussy, you didn't bother emphasize or stick to your point that my name must be spelled with an E or else. And I think if we're not doing these things, we're not emancipated as yet. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Charles. Um, I think, and I'm seeing persons reaching for their mic, which means this is really pulling out of you some comments that you'd like to share with us. But we have to take a quick break. And so when we come back, we will start with you, Mr. Preville. Mm. See a belty shop, innit? Very pretty. Hello, how are you? Hi, good day. How may I be of assistance? I I'm looking for some wicker items, yes? Yeah? Some hats, some bags, and perhaps some table mats. Do you have any of those? Ah, I'm so sorry, my mm. lady, but we do not have any straw mats. However, we do have some local pottery pieces, if you're interested. You don't have any? Well, it's about Fort Moyen. I don't know anyone who's producing these type of products. Musicians, designers, dancers, crafters, writers, have you taken action to put yourself or your business on the map? The Ministry of Tourism, Heritage and Creative Industries and the Cultural Development Foundation have launched the Cultural Mapping Project so we can map it to tap it. The cultural map will identify and promote our cultural and arts resources, making it easier for people to do business with you, as well as help development agencies and government understand the needs of the industry. So who should register? All traditional and contemporary individual artists, groups, cultural organizations, creative businesses, events, historical and cultural sites, resource centers, training facilities, promoters, managers, service providers who work in arts, culture, and creative industry. To get yourself mapped, head over to the Cultural Development Foundation at Barnard Hill in Cass Street today, or download the Android app from the Google Play Store. It's our culture. Map it to tap it. Look out for Team Map It in your community. And finally, and welcome back to our emancipation panel discussion. And just to remind you, our theme is emancipation through your eyes, tourism, politics, and economic freedom. And we're getting into what really that means, what's the underlying issues. And when we left, Mr. Preville, you had some comments you wanted to share? Just, just um, some comments based on what Embert said. I, I believe that having said everything I've said about tourism, and how I think it should work. There, are, there is need for us to, even in looking at the topic, I saw where it was going, but we need to think a little bit beyond even tourism. I, I think sometimes we, we say agriculture, tourism, manufacturing, but the world has moved on and there's something called information and communication technology. There, there, there are, and what has always remained constant in this great country called St. Lucia is intellectual capacity. And I think uh, there are so many brilliant young girls and boys in this country with ideas that we're not capturing those ideas. And I think we, we're not, we, we do not have an education system that 
that uh, is able to take ideas and nurture and grow. Uh, I work in the Ministry of Commerce, and I, I know the responsibility of taking ideas and making enterprises out of them rests with our ministry. And even there, there are so many constraints to make it really happen. And I think these, these are some of the things that have kept us less emancipated. Um, I believe, for instance, young people with a cell phone should be engaged in doing um, distribution online, network marketing, earning income from home. There are so many things that we're not really doing. So I think there are opportunities beyond the strict rubric of tourism, agriculture, manufacturing. But with respect to the tourism-centric thing and the politics that comes into this, I think politicians are constrained many a time when they get into office by conflicting demands. But there is another demand that is really hurting our politicians. And maybe they set, they set the standard by how they appeal to people to vote. The dependency syndrome created between the politician and the electorate. That I must need you to survive. You know, any great government, a great political party would want to see its people become less dependent on government and less dependent on individual politicians. So if you look at our country over the years, our people have grown increasingly dependent on the politician and not less. And if that has happened, it says to you, our emancipation has not really happened as yet. All right. Now with these words, and um, I see the reactions here among our panelists, and while this has been going on, I've been hearing the little comments from our audience. Let's just take this moment to say that we are opening up to the audience to make comments or um, questions. If you look to your right, there's a, ca there is, um, a mic there. You make your way to the mic, and um, we'll allow you to share your comments or ask any questions. So please, just, and don't be shy, just go up to the mic. I see a hand up, so. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I think this is a fascinating subject. A few things that I need to mention. First of all, uh, history are like voices of the past that repeat themselves. And the patterns that I'm seeing in St. Lucia are not really paying attention to the youth that is really knocking on our door and telling us to listen. One of the things that, I'm a St. Lucian, and I have choices to go other places on vacation, but I'm home. I'm home every summer. And one of the things that I do when I come here is speak to the market vendors. They are the ones that are part of the tourism product that have been cut out of tourism. I speak to the youth, and the things that they tell me is that, oh no, tourism isn't for me. I get nothing from it. So when you talk about emancipation, you'll have to look at in emancipation of the people and not emancipation relevant to the structures that represent their voices. Because I think politics has killed St. Lucia and has killed our youth. Our youth are like wild grass with no leadership. You're, Mr. Percival was saying, we need to find out what our identity is. It's always been there. It's never left us. I think the politicians have moved away from it. And one of the things that they need to start doing is going back to the people. In the United States, what has happened right now is that movements are now growing because the politicians are no longer listening. And the same thing is happening to St. Lucia. We need to have movements. We need to have new leadership. We need to have people who listen to the people, who listen to the youth, to find out entrepreneurship efforts. It doesn't always have to be tourism. Other sectors can come in that are alliances and linkages with tourism. But I think the idea of just agriculture and tourism is old and passe, and we need to start thinking of other structures and other um, industries that can help the people of St. Lucia. Thank you very much. Yes, go ahead, sir. This is a very good point. Uh, we're talking about emancipation, but we're still enslaved politically. We become a very tribal society. So we cannot have economic freedom when the red and yellow 
the red lackeys get the work. When the yellow is in power, the yellow lackeys get the work. So the youth on the block is cut off. The youth, the young lady who works in a bank who would like to go and study in Holland, who doesn't have a very exclusive surname, can't get completely cut up, and you need to have a, a political godfather. So we have no, this economic freedom thing is, a, is an illusion because we become enslaved within the politics, and it, sh it, it should be, this is wrong. Political parties are vehicle to good governance. When they get there, they need to govern for all solutions, and dash away this red and yellow nonsense that we keep promoting. It's just killing us. Thank you. Ms. Lago, yes? Yes, um, just to add on to what Cuthbert did say, and be it that I've gone through similar experiences in being a recent graduate. Um, the, the point brought up that we, it's, a re, it's a repeat of a cycle of us being enslaved again. There was always a, there's also a break from that slavery, and I do want to comment that not all the youth are, are brainwashed at this point by the red and yellow. I, w I can't speak for all, but I would like to say that I'm speaking for those that I do know that are educated, that are looking beyond the colors and looking out at what is being offered. Um, we recently had elections in 2016, 15, if I'm correct, and there was an internet movement to to stop the youth from voting. There were articles published telling other, other youth members to not vote because we are not being offered enough information, enough insight on what we are going to be get what we are going to be getting out of the election. So you could already see that there is a resistance to what is happening. And persons are disregarding the grand elder approach where, you know, it is said that tourism is the way and agriculture is the way. Persons are making their own avenues. When you, when you realize that a lot of the youth now are educated, they hold bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, and they're not getting work, they're starting to create their own. We see in the flourishing of, of young designers, how many persons here do know that there are, that there are more than three. In the beginning, eight years ago, it was probably one or two young persons designing. Now we have a, coll we have a collective of persons um, getting into swimwear and other carnival um, material, which is, which is already being looked at by TIPA to help export their product. So solutions are, at, at least the youth, are taking the reins of the horse and they're trying to lead their own way. So I want to say that there is beginning to be a break from that, the persons who need to look into that are the older persons disregarding the youth because there's a continual disregard. Oh, they don't know what they're doing. They're gonna fall and they're gonna realize it later. Let them do that. We need to change that focus and actually listen to what they're saying and see what of it makes sense and harness that, um, grow that, and, and treat that as, as something. Thank you. Our audience members spoke about breaking patterns and um, you're, it sounds like you're saying that the youth now are doing some of that because we keep talking about the way things are. Do you see or are you saying that maybe that um, emancipation is happening but now with the younger generation? It is a form of emancipation but when you have a small collective doing it, it just looks like a resistance to the system and then the youth still ends, ends up being labeled as the troublemakers. We need to see why they are rebelling. What is the root of the rebellion? Why persons no longer want to work? I, I know a few persons who have on their own left jobs because they said, this is not for me. I'm going to stay on my own, struggle um, be it, but I would try to make my own way. And they are doing that in the creative industries, which is why we've seen you know, the new formation of the creative industries and more attention being paid to that. So we need to um, pay more attention to that, definitely. And we could find a way forward. Music entertainment, culture, there is a way for it. We just need to focus on that. Yes, gentlemen, anyone who wants to make a comment on, oh, sorry, let's hold on to that. Go ahead, sir. Hi, afternoon. Um, yeah, emancipation, we know if emancipation, there was um, compensation paid to the planters. The Africans were never compensated. I would like the panelists to speak on what they, understand, what they th think about the, the role of reparations in terms of economic freedom, on the whole, and also for African people in St. Lucia. All right, thank you. Who would like to? Reparation. Um, my views may be very, very 
left. Um, I don't believe in reparations. I don't believe anybody owes me anything in life. I believe where I am is where I am. And where I am, I move from where I am. I believe if I'm going to wait for Europe, I know the history. I know what was done to us. I cannot undo that. What I have to do is to move forward. So I am not waiting for any form of reparation. I do, however, recognize that when you talk about reparation sometimes, we, we, we see reparation as an economic. If you look at an accounting structure, you would see if you put reparation there and someone gives you whatever millions, whatever it is, they give you a one-time lump sum. So here is your reparation. Share it among you. I'll finish with you. I'm not interested in that. I'm more interested in engaging the people who, through their efforts in the past, have me here, engaging them in a manner that gives me not a one-time payment, but a future of continuous income. Meaning, I engage you, we work, we trade, and I get my reparation that way. I am in, and, and more interested in sitting down with you and saying, here are the areas I want you to work with me in my economy, on different areas, that's where I get my reparation. But reparation as a payment, not interested. Well, I'm really right in the reparation thing. Slavery was an interruption to a great, 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 great dynasty. And who knows? So not only should you write a check, but you should review WTO and everything else that prevents us as a sovereign nation that built your European. When I went to Brussels and Belgium and I walked around and I saw these structures cladded with gold and the seat of the EU and all the, 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 the obnoxious wealth, these guys didn't mind that in, in Belgium. They took it from us, our ancestors. So everybody pays homage to the Jewish Holocaust. And, and, and the Jews have, have been able to be respected all around. Well, what, about, what happened to the African Holocaust? So sorry, I can't forget that. Maybe, as you say, we need to review the whole system so that the young people here, not only should you be a choice, but we should be able to go to school in the EU, in Europe, to the best schools, have a level playing field. Because, yes, intellectually, we might be small, but we can challenge them but we obviously do not have the resources. And the reason we do not have the resources is because we worked for 400 years and built their great nation. So sorry, I'm right on the reparation. Mr. Charles, your comments, please. I don't want to repeat Cuthbert's comments, but just for the record, I'm also right. <laughs> okay, yes. I see we have another audience member with um, a comment, yes. Okay, when I came to the mic, I was trying to comment on a comment made by one of the panelists about the disconnect between the political leadership or systems and, and say, what the youth want or, or the society. And I've heard that being said so many times in many different places. We talk about the political tribalism and all of that. Um, but we need to speak on the solution side. How do we remedy that situation? Um, we have a system where political groups or parties or whatever you wish to call them select our leaders based on an internal calculation, a calculation that makes sense to a group for an objective of their own, which may be to win a parliamentary majority. But that does not, that the decision calculus is not based on governance, which is really why we select governments ultimately. So when that group, for want of a better word, uh, wins an election, then the discussion or decision about governance, which is really why we actually elect them, comes to the fore. And then we end up with a situation where there's that disconnect you talk about, where our leadership um, seem not to be in step because we didn't debate, we didn't ask them what they brought, what was their legitimacy for leadership. We did nothing like that. But when the horse is bolted, we seem to now want to care about why. But we should have asked those questions before. And before I leave the mic, I want to say institutions matter. We have to create 
the regulatory framework, the institutions to give the outcomes we want. There's a saying that says a country gets the systems and the leadership that it deserves. So if we want to change that, we need to change the process by which we select our leaders and, and our political leadership. Thank you. Rest Thank you very much. And but, at this but, point, I, we are going to go to a very quick break. And when we come back, Mr. DJ will start off with you. Family time is a healthy time, and a healthy family eats smart. Local fish and seafood from fishermen and farmers that you trust with your family's health is always fresh. Choose fresh seafood because it's packed with nutrients. St. Lucia's fish and seafood producers meet every government standard for health and safety, high quality, fresh local food products straight from the fisherman to you. Choose St. Lucian Fish and Seafood at your local grocers and choose a healthy lifestyle for your entire family. I use fresh local fish right there from the fisheries department. Eat fresh, buy local. St. Lucia's fishermen produce an abundance of fresh foods, highly nutritious and incredibly tasty. Together when it's most important. Healthy families, buy fresh, eat fresh. And welcome back to our emancipation panel discussion. And we left on a high note. I saw my panelists discussing while we were at break. So we're going to start off to hear some of their comments with Mr. Didier. Yeah, I want to go back to my good friends, Danny's comments about institutions. I've already said that we're not free, so I don't want to echo that again. But there isn't an environment of truly people airing their views and being critical of institutions. When you criticize, you ostracize. Then you label. And depending on who's in power, you're the opposition. So the only way we could, in a realistic and mature way, deal with these institutions is to have dialogue. And I welcome this. I think this is a fresh forum, but look around. I dare say there ain't one politician here. There's a reason why. There's a reason why, and I keep going. The politics, let's begin with the end in mind. I want to be critical of these institutions, and I want to write, and I want to go on the talk shows, but I also want to discuss, because I have a point of view, and I'm open to a discussion. Is the climate and environment ripe in St. Lucia for mature discussion about anything, whether it's an investment in the South, whether it's a set of, of of mamas swimming somewhere. Is there a forum to do that? No. So, yes, I take your point that we should be critical of institutions, but there must be an enabling environment as we, we need to foster that. I said a few days ago, years ago we had a great mobilizer, George Odlum. You know, sometimes I sit down and I say, boy, we really miss him right now. We need mobilizers, young and old, to come forth because let's criticize, but also let's put on the heat and go face to face. And we need them more than ever. And before I, I, I finish up, in emancipation, we, we, we're celebrating emancipation. And has it ever dawned upon you that who are our heroes? Who do we celebrate? Who are the people that we, you know, apart from Sir Arthur and the same three names, we are not a people that celebrate homegrown heroes, whether it's Sami, whether it's the Rasta man doing the carving that died from a landslide. We sing a calypso and we give them an OBE and, and God bless their soul. So we, not only are we not even mobilized to criticize, we don't even mobilize to help one another and support each other. So when we discuss this emancipation day, Bob said it, we have to free ourselves from this mental slavery and this political contamination. I keep coming back to this politics because that is the root cause of this present slavery. Okay. Um, we have, uh, I think we have some, a member of the audience who would like to make a comment. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, we're here discussing at a point in time which comes around every year about our emancipation. And I dare say that emancipation was, if you will, thrust upon us because it was not on our terms. 
and we discuss emancipation throughout history and even up to now, thinking that it is just an escape from the slave plantations. And Cuthbert mentioned, or he alluded to it, and Bob Marley, and we're all familiar with the mental slavery aspect of slavery and its connection with emancipation. And looking at this discussion here today, walking in, you see that a number of seats are vacant. And it seems that for many people, the idea of emancipation or the discussion of our emancipation, whatever that is, is not sexy enough. It's not immediate enough. Our struggles have to produce immediate results. So we have the panel here discussing emancipation, but how does that emancipation discussion turn into a direction, into a movement, into an understanding, into a thinking of the people to have a meaningful or the desired result? Because we can go through these motions year in and year out, but what we seem to fail to realize is that all the influences of slavery in whatever color, shape, or form that they have enslaved us over the hundreds of years still exist, whether it's in the music, whether it's in the fashion, whether it's in business, whether it's in finance. All of the slavery influences still affect and have a daily influence on our lives. So how do we get out of the current day slavery? We recognize it, but we also recognize that we are small countries. We have limited economies of scale. So how do we craft our exit from modern day slavery? Thank you very much, sir. Um, Mr. Charles? Yes, I just want to respond to the comments you normally hear that um, we keep on talking and talking and talking. Talking is important. If we don't talk, we don't discuss, we don't vent our feelings, our ideas, and so forth, it is necessary sometimes to get some action out of the talking. But doesn't, you don't put a constraint on your, your, your freedom to express yourself or to share your thoughts because you come to a discussion, you think nothing will come out of it. Yeah. We, we, we encourage our systems to, to, to um, develop curricula for children, to ask them to question, to ask them to be creative. You have to be, keep on doing these things over and over. I mean, talking, if, if it's a strength we have in talking, let's use it. Someday something will come out of it. And revolutions don't necessarily start with large crowds, you know. They start with small groups. In terms, in terms of commenting on your, the, what do you do, given where you are, there is a lot we can do. We, we have to look at ourselves in relation to our brothers and sisters. There is strength in unity. We have countries around us. We are, we are part of a collective, an OECS, for instance. We're not doing much to build on that. It's being done at a high esoteric level. But these are the things that I think we can use to begin to create our interdependence among ourselves in the OECS and greater independence in terms of our economic freedom. We're not working with each other much. We're not doing that. We are going about these things as an each island on its own. What does, what does, that, ha what does that do? We become even more and more vulnerable a country like St. Lucia is extremely vulnerable. Vulnerable economically, socially, and otherwise. So there are things we can do, and it begins, it begins in the school. It begins with the quality of the instruction, the curricula. It begins by making sure our kids are taught our history properly. And history not necessarily in the past, our modern history, our, about our own people the history of our own St. Lucians, the St. Thomas, and all of those people, the teachers who taught us in the past, these are the things we don't teach. We don't celebrate each other. We do not celebrate each other. 
we try to put each other down. Other countries celebrate the people. It is those things, my brother, we need to do to begin to remove the shackles and to emancipate ourselves when we begin to believe in ourselves. Thank you. Um, we are going to have comments from Ms. Lago, and then we're going to go back into the audience. Yes. Just as uh, Mr. Preville said, the answer is education and fine-tuning our education to be more St. Lucian and more Caribbean. Um, he brought forth an excellent point that emancipation in itself was thrusted upon us as opposed to us going forth and saying that we take it. So once that day came and we were emancipated, what happened? Nothing really changed. The mindset stayed. And like you said, the emancipation, the, the mental emancipation was not there. Now, in order for us to move forward and to go past the talking point, there needs to be a choice made. But the choice cannot be made, as you rightfully said, if persons are, don't know how to critically think about what we are discussing. This is why, as you said, there's only a select factor of society that will come to these discussions and engage in such a topic. Other persons will not find it sexy because they do not know about it. So if we, be, we begin at the schools and we begin to re-educate, introduce more St. Lucian-based curricula and Caribbean curricula, as we, we spoke about on break, we spoke about how the Jews were educated about the, the Holocaust, they were educated about their history, but what are we being educated on? So I think that that is the answer to the very brilliant point that you brought about, which is our education system. If persons are educated, young and old, then we can have a, we can have a cumulative discussion and then we can make the choice as a state to move in whichever direction that so fits the people of St. Lucia. Thank you, and um, sir, your comments, please, or your question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, my question is, um, we're talking about culture, and we can't have culture unless we deal with the foundation of culture, which is agriculture. So I want to know why, as the lady was saying, there's a decline in agriculture. Is our land not fertile? Why are we not promoting you know, organic food to the world? when we can see that's the trend, you know, why is this not addressed? So can you tell the people why we're not interested in food and we're exporting so much food? You know, that's, that's one of my questions, thank you. Thank but, you, sir. Very good question. I think from my perspective, part of the reason I think this is happening is because of who our leaders are and what sectors they're coming from. There isn't a culture of self-sufficiency in St. Lucia. There isn't a we we gone are the days when we ate the fat pork and the ackee. Now we want the grapes that actually spoil two days after you get them, or the apples. We don't want the golden apples. So again, but as Embert said, look at where we're getting the pool of the politicians that we elect. Are they coming from the agriculture basin? No. They're coming from the private sector, some are minibus operators, and you know, kudos to them, they've done well. Some are from the hotel sector, etc. So, and also as a people too, as a people, and it might be the psyche, there isn't a, a we, when you, there is also almost a phobia about what's local. Meaning if it's local, it's not good enough. And we need to address that. You know, you, boy, that's local, sapa So uh, it's, again, as a nation, we need to be critical and we need to address it. And it's a very, very good point. I don't have a solution, but I know it starts with those that are trying to fashion the vision for us. Yeah. Just in addition to Kovac's response, I think we have to be mindful also that our society, our economies were built on mercantile trade. There are merchants who bring in things and sell it to make a profit. That has become the, the core of our economic base in our society. They have interests. They have been facilitating the change of the taste buds of our people to the extent that people don't even know or like the taste of a local fruit because they're so used to the foreign fruit. And we are being indoctrinated to believe that it's easier to get and consume a foreign fruit. You would hear comments like, a mango is too messy to take to school. Why should it bring a golden apple to school? Because you have to peel it. Whether you throw the seed, you could just take an apple or grapes. 
These types of subtle and not so subtle messages contribute to the decline of our appreciation for our local agriculture as well. Thank you. Yes, sir, your question or comment, please. Yeah, thanks. Good evening, everybody. Um, I must say the discussion has been very spirited and, and certainly um, very welcoming. Uh, a lot of good ideas have actually been forwarded through this, this panel discussion, and some of the audience questions have also alluded to um, focusing on addressing those problems. And I think one of the things that we need to look at is the whole idea of a broad development plan moving forward that can capture all those ideas, that can capture all the specific issues, political, cultural, social, and bring it together. What Arthur Lewis gave us in his in industrialization of the British West Indies, which he published in 1950, was a plan. And we may not have gone forward and implement that plan. And there may even be a question as to whether the Arthur Lewis's model is still relevant today. It may still be relevant today. But then where is that new plan that looks at the 21st century and the new age, the new challenges, that also brings in um, some of the ideas of Arthur Lewis, that brings in some of the, the new ideas that, uh, that, 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 of course, take on board some of the issues that we're now confronted with, the whole issue of economic globalization, the whole issue of trade liberalization. How do we address that matter? I mean, I, I, I heard a discussion about tourism. The statistics have actually shown that what's happening with tourism in the Caribbean is a case of declining competitiveness. We are not as competitive in selling tourism as perhaps the Dominican Republic and other, and other regions. How then do we address these issues? Right? Where does the education sector fit into the broader plan? So these are the issues I think a, a broad economic, social, whatever plan you, you may wish to call it, can, can address. Thank Thanks. you very much, sir. Excellent contribution. I want to just drop a dime here. You realize that when we speak about tourism, it's oftentimes land-based tourism. Nobody speaks about the yachting industry. When compared to cruise ship, it's six times greater an economic contributor. But every time people, CTO doesn't even collect stats on yacht arrivals, okay? Yachting, you need very, in, little, very little infrastructure. Ask Sufre, look at Sufre. Sufre has been the mecca of yachting. Every yacht that leaves Martinique, and Martinique has close over 60,000 yachts, heads to Sufre to drop anchor en route to the Grenadines. The Grenadines is probably one of the biggest water parks in the Western Hemisphere. Go down and visit it. So your point is well taken. Not only do we have to revisit tourism and do tourism with very limited environmental and social impacts, but also we need to stop focusing on this brick and mortar tourism that we need to build something huge. I had a, the talk about community-based tourism. Everybody, anybody know whether a business plan was ever written for Grosile Night? It just evolved. It evolved, and look at that. After all these years, it's, one of, it's billed as one of the what? The best parties in the Caribbean. There was no business model, no business plan. So I, your point is well taken. We need to regroup, we need to discuss, but also we need to have an open mind. And that's why I keep talking about this slavery. We need to be able to accept the old, but be ready to take new initiatives within all these industries. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. OK, I've been listening with a lot of interest. But I think one of the things I want to start by saying is that our generation has failed the future generations. I'm sorry. But we have been existing in a kind of a individualistic, selfish kind of world. I have heard, let me give you a very small example. I have heard people talk about the fact that there is only visual bras and panties for carnival. Well, why not? When we were going to mass camp, did we take our children? Did we do anything in school about creating mass camp so that the children could understand what it is to build a costume? So why should they not want what they can just go and pick up at a building? These are some of the things I'm going to think. But one of the, the main issues here for me 
is that this kind of, of um, industry and progress that we've been talking about has been going on without the development of our civil society, without the development of our social programs with specific focus on the youth. This panel discussion, I would love to hear it with under 20 children. I would love to hear what they are thinking about this particular discussion. Because to me, you see us, our time has passed. Let us talk, yes, but let us understand that whatever we have to do now is to prepare for the next generation. And I'm not seeing enough of that. Right now, the present generation has no voice. And they are growing up, not even being interested in anything. They're not interested in anything St. Lucian because what they get at their fingertips has nothing to do with the culture and traditions of this country. Everything, I don't understand how somebody can be focusing on um, hotels and the tourism industry without the same focus on the development of our culture. I just cannot understand that because to be one goes without the other. Sometimes I go to some of the hotels and I am totally shocked at what they are giving as St. Lucian. I think the other point about, about this lack of development of our civil society, the entire Caribbean is suffering from a lack of leadership. Just look through the entire Caribbean and see what we have as leaders and what they are saying. I think this whole consultation that we're speaking about, it should be written as a legal part of the parliamentary process, that it has to have consultation or it cannot go forward. Our youth are, for, are, are the generations for tomorrow. Let us prepare them, let us talk, and let us try to rally and do stuff that will prepare them, because too often, we are talking among ourselves as adults and forgetting the youth. Thank you very much, ma'am. Yes, sir. Um, good evening. Um, as someone who has traveled extensively throughout the Caribbean, I am a little bit perplexed by the, the concept of um, emancipation as far as concerned in St. Lucia. I would say, I would even go further and say that, I, to me it's a joke, really a joke. Um, and I want to give some examples of what I'm saying. For example, throughout the region, or in throughout the world, we celebrate Haiti as our first black republic within the region. But yet, a Haitian had to get a visa to come to St. Lucia, and to travel to many other Caribbean countries as well. That shows me that we are not really serious about emancipation. That's one of the, 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 the reasons I'm saying so. Now, for, I, I don't know if you're still a PS, uh, Mr. Preville, but I initiated a, 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 a project um, that he supported uh, about a year or two ago as a former cultural attaché to the Consular General Office in, at Martinique. And the project was based on the fact that there's no other region within the Caribbean other than Haiti who have utilized the African knowledge to develop themselves culturally and artistically. And I was trying to use that artistic ability that they have so that we could set our tourism product to a different level. When the tourists come to St. Lucia, what do they buy? Products that are imported from China, from Taiwan, from all, even other parts of the region. And part of the project, there's a, a, project, a simple project called Papier Marché, for example, that they take newspapers and make birds out of it, make animals out of it, paint them up beautifully, and they could form any kind of Caribbean animal or whatever, um, iguanas or whatever, out of that paper. That is one of the projects. We talk about carving, we talk about using metal, talk about using stones. They take stones from a river and create art out, out of that. And I'm talking about taking those knowledge that we could share with other, within the region among ourselves so that we could teach St. Lucians in different villages. I was targeting, for example, uh, Brosile, uh, Ansteray, um, some of the, 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 the areas that we know that are touched economically, right? So that those individuals would learn how to create those objects that they could sell directly to the, uh, not directly to the tourists, but directly to the, the vendors that would, in, 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 in return, sell to the tourists. So they would have a ready market for the products. 
So I mean, this is the way we have to go. If we're going to continue having um, our, our uh, tourists, sorry, the tourists come to the region and buy imported stuff that is not indigenous to us, it makes no sense. So here we are creating jobs at the same time. I want to touch a little further too on, 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 um, on another aspect of the tourism um, um, product. We, uh, somebody spoke earlier about the comparison with, with, with uh, the cost of, 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 um, of vacationing here with Santo Domingo and those countries, and that's a reality. Yeah? But again, here we have an opportunity to marry what we call our, our um, indigenous um, 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 hotel industry, right? And the future. Solar energy. As far as I'm concerned, every new hotel that is built in this country should be powered by solar energy. You know, why should we continue to be using fossil fuel when we have the natural energy of the sun you know, that would lower the cost of, of, of a room? Because you no longer have to pay loose slack or whoever. You know what I'm saying? I mean, come on. We live in modern times. Today, solar energy is not experimental, it works. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Um, first of all, I, my name is Michael Anjo. I'll speak on two fronts, one as an individual and also as the president of the Inola Council for Advancement of Rastafari. I want to thank the panelists for a really positive um, evening so far. Um, also, I want to um, thank CDF for making this event a very possible one and a successful one. Um, just a few things before I go into my little presentation. I just want to tell the panelists that um, although we have spoken about the need for Caribbean and national integration of our culture into our education system, we must not leave out Africa. That is a link we cannot leave out. That's, that's our motherland. That's where it all started. And we're talking emancipation, so you cannot leave out Africa. Um, the other thing is that it surprises me that on the panelists there, no one has mentioned the lack of a development plan for this country, which is something we talk about lack of vision, all these things, but within a plan, all that will be set. The last brother spoke about um, economic plan. Fair enough, but all that is inclusive in a national development plan. So hence the reason why when parties come every five years, they shuffle and they shuffle and come up with their own plans. There is no Bible for the development of this country. Look at what is happening to our lands. The cul-de-sac area, primary agricultural land, what is it now? We're losing our valleys and our lands. So when we talk about food security and food safety, we're actually moving backward. So unless we have a development plan that takes every component into existence, into the idea, the whole issue of constituencies, all right, and town hall meetings, I totally support you. That should be an ongoing thing. So when you come into party, into power, sorry, these constituency plans are what you have to work from. You're not coming and develop new plans that the people are not aware of. They're not sensitized to. Our people have no ownership of nothing. No ownership. I was telling Boots a while ago, although the constitutional reform, maybe it has an extensive thing, but it was done on a constituency basis. People would understand what a constitution is, and they would have greater input, and they could claim ownership of it. No one can claim ownership of it, but those that actually were presenting it. So I think we need to look at ownership from that perspective. Just a few points based on what was said. Um, Primus mentioned the issue of vertical integration in terms of the whole pattern of development of the hotel and the tourism industry. Now, if that is what is happening right now, that means we have another form of colonization taking place in this country, another form of slavery, all right? Because you cannot tell me that the, the companies now are actually trying to get agreements with the landowners that have these facilities so they control everything. Something has to be done. The other thing I want to say is that this program today should be on a more national basis. Now I'm speaking as I'm president of ICA. This program should be, we should have a national committee for emancipation. And when we sit and we plan, emancipation activities start two to three weeks prior to the 1st of August. And we have a legitimate basis for establishment, for functioning, that what comes out in this meeting or in this gathering goes to parliament. 
that's the kind of approach we need to take. That's all I'll say. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. We have time for just one more person. So, um, you mentioned uh, Cuthbert mentioned slavery, and um, it, we had an interruption. And we've also talked about the children. They need to change the way they think. But the fact is, we don't know how we used to think before the interruption. There's plenty of things that would benefit our people if we studied our culture before slavery. It would help, you would see how we uh, looked on, not religion, but more God consciousness. How we looked at community and how we respected the, the elders and how we're supposed to bring up the children as warriors and, and uh, innovators. You know, all of this was in our history before. So we keep saying slaves, 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 and this what happened, an interruption. But they need to know how were we thinking before slavery. And I think if we target that, we will see some beautiful gems to help our people here in St. Lucia. Thank you very much, sir. Yes. We have time for just maybe one or two quick comments from the panelists. Just to um, summarize the, the comments and the thoughts of everyone here, it brings to question um, with regards to emancipation, the two trails of thought that, that, led the path, that lead the path to where we are now. The first one being at emancipation, most persons here are speaking of wanting to go back to our roots, uh, whether it be African roots, whether it be developing our own Caribbean roots. And the other path that we did go on, unfortunately, would have to be with wanting to run away from slavery. On that emancipation day, when persons are told that they are quote unquote free, they want to, there was a need to escape from anything that reminded you of enslavement, whether it be the food, whether it be the, um, the, the religious rituals that you were forced to take on, etc., And this is why Europe is still the model for excellence. What we see now is that there's a struggle where persons think that our culture as well as our African roots are pretty much a reminder of the past and something that we do not want, which is why a lot of us have gone on the road, even our governments have gone onto that road. Okay, thank you for that. And at this point, we'll take our final break. And when we come back, we'll hear from our panelists their final words. Wait. Pablo, that's you? Yeah, man. Just planning to set up another hotel here. Look at this beautiful view. Boy, I don't know, you know. This area is popular for large mangroves, and you know that mangroves are important nurseries for marine life, supporting the business of fishermen and seafood vendors. In fact, the mangrove also serves as a control, and it stops many things that pollute the sea. Do you know that whatever you build here can destroy the marine life? So? So? So my friend, if you check the Department of Environment, they will advise you on how your plan will help or her development in this area. Really? I read something like that in the St. George's Declaration of Principles for Environmental Sustainability in the OECS. Yes. You know jobs and money are not all when you have a business. I need to ensure that my business is environmentally friendly for this community. Can we talk over lunch? Regular sure. place? Sure. You paying, of course. Contact your local Department of Environment and how you can make your community provide a better quality of life for all. And welcome back to the Emancipation Panel Discussion brought to you by the Cultural Development Foundation. Our theme has been Emancipation Through Your Eyes, Tourism, Politics, and Economic Freedom. And at this time, as we close off, each of our panelists are going to give their final words, and we shall start with Mr. Charles. Um, sir, just, just let our panelists make the, the comments, and then we'll come to you. Yes. I want to just, my final comments would be that um, we have to realize that the people who create problems for us will not want to solve the problems because it's to their benefit. So we have to look towards a different sector in our society for solutions to the situation we're facing now and to support some of the, the um, comments from the floor, we have to look at civil society. I think that is where some of the energy, the new ideas will come from. 
And I think all of us should be committed to one in one way or another supporting a civil society group, consumer association, your own Ayanola Improvement Association or whatever. And to me, that is the way we should go. Thank you. Mr. Breville? Yeah, I think this was a very good initiative by CDF. Um, the question now is, is there a civil society ready to engage discussion of anything, any subject? We don't talk in this country. We do not have any place where we speak in this country. I don't know any politician holding anybody for gun to the head saying do not speak. I don't understand why people talk about politicians. If you express a view, they think left or right. Since when politicians were your masters? I know they're not my master. So if you feel they are your master, you have a problem. This is a free country. And we have freedom to think and express our thoughts once we are genuine in what we're saying. If you have a genuine intention, express your thought. I want to thank you very much. And I believe this is a very good uh, uh, um, forum. And I hope we have it more, more often. Thank you very much, sir. Ms. Lagom? Yes, I would just like to echo Mr. Preville's um, words. I do hope that we continue to have this conversation. This was an excellent um, discussion put together by CDF, and I'm grateful for that. Um, we've heard from ourselves as well as the audience that there needs to be more dialogue, and this is only the beginning. A lot of ideas have come out of wanting um, the youth as well as the rest of civil society to engage in conversation, and I, I think why not? And this should be a call for us to do this more often, and at least for one person in here to take the initiative to start that conversation. Thank you, miss. Mr. Didier. <laughs> I prefer just Didier. Um, <laughs> I have to say, well, thanks to CDF and also very esteemed, bright people on this panel. I really enjoyed it. And from the floor, I want to thank the brother from ICA. I, I thought it was a very good summary of a way forward that look at emancipation day celebrations in a, in a, a build up and form a committee, and maybe you can start. From CDF, I would definitely volunteer my time because I think it is worth it. But in summing up, I do want to say that let us take this, this concept of freedom serious. For a long time, we dig Rastafari movement and we hear about Africa and all the heroes. I want to say I learn about black history through listening to reggae music. That's the first time I, listen, I heard about Steve Biko and all these other people. The brother said something which is very, very positive, and the other contributor. We need to go back to the roots, and we need to make sure that it's in the school curriculum. You know, and not only start from the people who came, but go back. A, a one book that has really changed my vision of the Caribbean was by Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. And maybe we should start from there by making it mandatory from all the secondary schools. But I have to say kudos to CDF and a wonderful audience. And we've come to the end of our emancipation panel discussion. And we would like to take this time to say thank you to Flo, the Cultural Development Foundation, Baywalk Shopping Mall, and NTN. And of course, our wonderful panelists and our audience. We will see you next year, or maybe as has come out from this, a discussion maybe maybe next month, next week.